everybody and, uh, and welcome. So uh, thank you, Sunita, for the warm introductions. I'm very, very happy to be here. I think the, the genesis for this presentation is actually a, a difficult conversation I had when I was first brand manager 28 years ago. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a massacre, so I just, I just want to get a feel for the audience. Any hands up who is not 28 years old in here? <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be a bit of prenatal advice for you guys that I received 28 years ago. And it was uh, from a, market, a US marketing director at the pharmaceutical firm I was working at. And he, no he noticed my adversarial relationships with our sales colleagues, with our market research department. And he took me aside probably after about a week after I started my brand manager role. And he said, Bruce, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. And the one piece of advice is that your success in your career is going to depend more on what you can get other people to do than what you do yourself. So stop fighting and start working together. And I think, for me, that was something I tried to listen to throughout the course of my, my career. I wasn't always successful. Uh, but when I took this role on as Global CMO 10 years ago, it was probably the most relevant thing I could think of. Because suddenly I was moving out of an operational role I was no longer actually going to do any marketing. These guys were going to do all the marketing. And I realised that the only thing I could do to add value was to try and create those conditions where Mars marketers could really flourish and produce their best work. Because any of my success was going to be down to the, you know, the 2,000 marketers that we have working within us. And so that's, that's been the driving guideline for me as I think through the last 10 years of the role of CMO. And I want to share with you some of the things we've learnt, because it's not just what I've learnt. Uh, all the Mars marketing department uh, around the world is, is learning the same way. We're not perfect, so Sunita's asked us to provoke you. I'm going to provoke uh, some of this stuff we're still unhappy with internally, but I want to share with you the way we think about how we create those conditions for creative excellence. And the first thing what I looked at when I, I took this role on was our agency partners, because clearly we can't drive creative excellence within Mars. We need very strong agency partners. And so we, I looked at that and I said, how do we operate with our agency partners and how could we be better? And I, I would advise everybody to sit back and think about the relationship we have. And probably the insight that, that I got was, are we creating a situation where our agency partners are prisoners and we've got them locked down? Or are we actually creating a condition where they can perform to their ultimate ability? Because if they can perform to their ultimate ability, then we can grow our business and they can grow their business and we can have some mutual success. I think I'll share with you that the things that I've learnt in, in the 23 years at Mars and the 10 years as a CMO in terms of how to free up the prisoners in, in our agency relationship. I think there are four conditions that I've talked about in terms of creative imprisonment. And the first one is subsistence rations. So, <laughs> I'll get another guide from the, from the audience. Hands up who works in an agency network here. Okay, so a good, a good smattering in here. There's often a debate, and, and, and there's a good tension internally within a client as to what we should be paying our agencies. Now, my, re my belief, and my strong belief, is that we have to pay them enough to make a very good profit. We want our agency partners to make a great profit. Because if they're making a good profit, they can recruit the best talent to come and work on our business. And we're very disciplined in terms of working out how our creative impacts our sales. So we have, we have a, long history in single source data, so we're able to measure all of our creative in terms of is it one star with no impact or is it four star with you know, 40 plus impact of an individual household. And I want to recruit, I want our agencies to be able to recruit the type of talent that can produce four star advertising. And when I think about the billions of dollars we spend on our advertising, it is worth making sure that we reward our agency structure and agency teams enough that they can reward their people and have them motivated to work on our business. So yes, we're still fiscally responsible. We still have uh, commercial teams looking at our contracts, but the guiding principle is we want them to have predictability on their income stream, transparency, and we work together to drive productivity uh, and reduce our, both of our costs. But the important thing is make sure they can be fed and they recruit the best talent. The second one is mandatory rules. So, so again, when you sit down and do a brief and you create all of these rules of 10 or 15 mandatory 
uh, things we want to see in the advertising, there is no way we can get to great creativity. And it reminds me, when I first started with Mars back in 1992, thank you, Sunita, uh, I, I sat down with our pedigree, I was a chum and good old brand manager in, uh, in Wodonga, and I sat down with our pedigree brand manager, a uh, guy called Andy, and he took me through the, the process to do great advertising for a 30 second ad. And he literally took me through the second by second, at the four second mark, you put the chunk of meat on the fork, at the eight second mark, you have the dog looking expectantly up at that chunk of meat. And between the 20 and the 23rd second mark, what we need to do is we, the agency needs to create some magic bonding between the owner and the dog, and that's what's going to create the great creativity. And I'm not joking, that was actually laid out there. And I think, you know, and I've done this at, at stages in my career, we, we maybe not go second by second, but we put all these mandatory rules. And I think what you do is you pr produce advertising that is very, very mediocre. I judge advertising pretty simply. I say, is this something I want to watch again? Is this something I'm sitting at home and it comes on my television screen or on my computer and I yell out to my wife and I say, Claire, Claire, quick, come in here. You've got to see this ad. It's just brilliant. That's not an ad I'm going to be yelling out to my wife and say, you've got to come in and see how these sticks of gum jump around. But you can see what we've done. You can see the client brief in there. We need to get the pack shot in the first one second as you open on that. We need to get the low calorie stick across there. We need to get the variety of key lime pie across there. We need to do it in 15 seconds. That's your brief and make it very interesting and exciting. So at Mars, we're, we're trying to break that. We're trying to break the mandatory rules. We're trying to create creativity and, uh, and unleash that. I hope that you share my enthusiasm that we're starting to get it more, right more often than we're getting it wrong. I think the third area is the layers of prison wardens. So if you have mandatory rules and then you have uh, you know, 20 people that you've got to produce, create, present creative to, and it goes into ascending order, then there is no way you're going to get great creative product uh, produced from this point of view. And so we've created a situation where we're very clear about our ad leaders. Uh, so there is one designated ad leader per campaign development or per execution development. And that ad leader doesn't have to be the most senior person, but it is the person charged with the responsibility. And yes, they can take input from other people, but they are the ones that make the call. Uh, I'm asked my opinion. I'm not an ad leader on anything. So uh, I do get to input some, uh, some opinions, but the person responsible within Mars has to take the call and take the responsibility. And they have to be at every key meeting. So it's no use having you know, this death by committee uh, in terms of going through 15 layers of, advertise, of advertising approval then you finally get to somebody and it's got some watered down approach. So very, very clear about who your advertising leader is, who the person with the ultimate responsibility and hold them accountable and have them make sure that they are there in every key meeting to make those decisions. And yes, we need to bring our junior markers along, we need to expose them to what's happening, we need to have them have experience but we have to be very clear about who is making the, the call. And the last one is this thought of the threat of death row. And I just, this is a personal thing, I just can't understand anybody who thinks that we can get the best out of our agency partners if we have got them on constant threat of dismissal. I just look at it very simply. Would I want to turn up to work on a Monday with my boss saying, OK, if you don't do good enough work in the next month, you're out? No, I wouldn't. So uh, we have to create an atmosphere and an environment where you don't have this idea of fear and passivity from our agencies. If they are thinking about threat of dismissal, if they have all these mandatory rules, all they're going to be doing is sitting there saying, what do you want? I'll give it to you. They're not going to be challenging us. They're not going to be pushing us. They're not going to be taking us to another level, which is what we need. And so my advice to you is that we need to remove those bars from your agency network. And that's a starting point. It's only a starting point because the, the absence of fear is not good enough to create, create uh, creative. We really need to do it one step further. But unless you remove those bars, we're never going to get to brilliant creativity on our brands. So my first provocation is look very hard about how, we, how you manage as clients the agency relationship. Hold a mirror up and say, does this really work? Get input back. From, uh, from your agency partners and make sure that uh, they feel comfortable that they can come and challenge us. And I think uh, the first act I did as a CMO was actually to remove the, the opportunity or the authority for anybody to dismiss uh, an agency partner anywhere in the world on one of our brands. That could only be done through consultation with myself and with the CEO. And that sent three clear signals. One, 
what we believe in our agency relationships. The CEO is an active partner in our agency relationships and he would, with me, decide what and who would be working in our business, which meant that if there were any local challenges, we work through them. It was like a marriage. You have, you have your ups and downs. Uh, if the first sign of a down is, I'm going to move on to another agency, they will never learn and create institutional knowledge that is so beneficial for us. I think the, th the third one is that really help them come and challenge us, challenge us locally, which is what we want. We want to drive that challenge. And that leads into an area of great creativity. And so I'm going to talk now about how you actually create great performances. And I think uh, yeah, removing the creative imprisonment was one thing. How do you get to a level of great performances? And when I talk about great performances, I'm talking about sustained performance. Yeah, everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people can produce one-hit wonders. Uh, the question is, how do you create an environment where you can be top of the charts year after year after year? And that's a challenge. Uh, and I, th I think there's opportunity to look outside of our industry and into the entertainment industry to look at great performers that have sustained success over you know, a long period of time. And in doing that, I've created a legacy that's changed their whole industry. So I've already established my vintage for my 28 years. So I'm going to take you back a little bit further than 28 years. I'm going to take you back to the 60s and back to the Beatles and have a look what we could learn from, from what they did that was so outstanding that they created such a legacy. And I think when you, when you look at the Beatles, yeah, the impact they had was just phenomenal. And uh, you can see the girl in the middle with the I Love Ringo badge. She's crying because she, her mother bought her the badge of the ugly Beatle rather than the attractive Beatle. But uh, really understanding what they did and how they did that is important. For those people that were under 28 years, I'm just going to give you a bit of background as to who the Beatles are because you know, I didn't know who the music was when I walked up, but I do know these guys. Back in 1963, on the Billboard Top 100, they had number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five hits, and another seven in the Top 100. This was phenomenal. Never before achieved, never since repeated. This was, yeah, you know, these guys were a phenomenon. Phenomenon. And they had a success. They had a, you know, they had a clear way of operating, a clear model that was working and driving massive success all over the world. The question is, what did they have to overcome? So what did, what did John, Paul, George, or Ringo have to overcome to, to, to really sustain success beyond 1963? They were one of the original boy bands, really, if you think about it. But they uh, went on to be one of the greatest bands ever. And fundamentally, I believe what they had to, had to overcome is complacency. It was very easy when you're sitting there saying, OK, we've got this phenomenal success. Let's just keep churning it out. Let's keep doing exactly the same thing over and over and over again, because it works. But they didn't. They pushed themselves, and they pushed themselves very hard. And there's a great quote from their, their producer, George Martin, who talked about, he thought that their success actually gave them confidence to do things that they wouldn't have done uh, or dared to do before. And that's quite a, you know, quite a big insight in terms of how you want to create conditions for creative excellence. You have to drive that confidence that you can reinvent yourself, that you can be dissatisfied with the success we have today but want to move forward. For me, there are four areas that I'd like to, to share with you that guide our approach as we think about how we can be better at Mars. And as I said, we're not there. It's a continual journey as to how you do that. But these are four insights that we work on and we work against, and you know, the four conditions of creative excellence. And the first is the reality is that performers perfect their craft. They don't just sit up there and say, OK, well, you know, it's not something, you know, something I'll do on the weekend. They perfect their craft. We know from the Beatles stuff, you know, that the Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours of work in Hamburg, you know, over and over and over again, just, just refining what they do, becoming excellent musicians, and it, and it plays out. You can, see, you can see the value of what they do. But they also let dissatisfaction drive their creative ambition. So there's a great story about how they were on tour and they were filling out stadiums, you know, 50, 70, 80,000, never done before, but no one was hearing the music they were doing. And so they were dissatisfied with what, with what they were progressing. And so they made the decision to say, we need to be better, and we can't get better touring, so let's go into the, into the studio, let's start working with different musicians, let's really work as to what we want to do, and redefine the type of music we want, to, we want to play. And I think, again, that's a 
a big insight for us is that we need to simultaneously be very satisfied with the work you do when you produce great creative, and then the next breath sit there and say, but where can I go next? And I think uh, creating that condition to move there is, is very important. So when we get that spark of, why is this working? And whether it's in advertising, whether it's in games, whether it's in music, films, books, why, why are people responding to this stuff? Then as, you know, as advertisers and as uh, communicators, both within the agency and within the client, we need to go out and be curious. How can we work with this? You know, how can we bring in technology partners to think about differently how we reach our consumers? Be curious, be collaborative. And then lastly, it's not less from the Beatles, I've got this, this insight from a, a Canadian planner with BBO who told me an experience he had in, uh, in Toronto. He said he, he used to go to a comedy club and uh, Jerry Seinfeld came this year four times. Uh, and he said the first time Jerry Seinfeld came, he was, he was a big star at this stage, he bombed. He got polite applause, but his material just wasn't, wasn't really good. The second time was much better. By the fourth time, he was knocking them uh, down, and everybody was just in hysterics. And I think the reality is we're not going to get this right all the time. Uh, but you need to be able to think about how you hone your craft, how you drive that, how you go out on the, on the edge. I prefer to fail spectacularly about what we want to do than fail safe. Uh, and I think we do need to fail spectacularly but fail cheap, so we need to find ways that we don't, it doesn't mean that we go and invest a billion dollars behind this, this uh, new approach without ever having worked out, does this work? Jerry Seinfeld never went on a tour without testing his material and refining his material and producing that to a, to a great level. I think we have to figure out how we can do that, how we can push the boundaries, try that uh, stuff that we haven't tried before, but do it in a way we can learn and therefore continually learn and, uh, and move forward. So that's the kind of the background. I want to take you now in, in, the, in the last 20 minutes through how we're applying that in Mars. What are we trying to do? How does this change the way we think about uh, our partnerships with our agency partners and the work that we're producing? I honestly believe that we need to be thinking at Mars, at BBO, at DDB, at Mediacom, what makes great communication, what makes great creativity, and explore that, examine that. And we need to do that from a point of view that says, let's understand, one, what the role of advertising and communication is in driving growth. So really understand how the brands and how the categories grow, and who can we partner with to do that. We then need to understand how people understand information. How does the brain work? How do we actually start to decode how some of this works within, within the brain? It's not, a, and it's not an A to Z or a color book of producing creative, but it is understanding you know, what's the role of humor, why do people have emotion, how do you make this personally relevant? And again, there are experts out there we can bring in. And we really need to think about how we, how we drive that forward. We believe if we, if we can create that environment where we are collectively curious and collaborative, and we can collectively inter interact with other companies outside that have skill sets we don't, then we can lift our total performance.